great. I think we should be live now. So welcome everyone to um, today's panel on the changing um, Chinese foreign policy together with Professor Tony Syke and Professor Kerry Brown. Um, to give a quick introduction to our, um, to our guests on this panel, um, Professor Anthony Syke is the director of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard Kennedy School and Dai Wu Professor of International Affairs. Um, Professor Kerry Brown is Professor of Chinese Studies and Director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. And they both are um, not only extremely knowledgeable in the field of um, Chinese domestic and foreign politics, but um, I think they also know each other. So um, I think this, hopefully this will be just a friendly discussion amongst friends and not necessarily a hard fought battle amongst academics. But um, to also give a quick introduction to the topic or topics rather we will dis be discussing today and we will start this by a quick discussion about how China as a country has moved from the rather periphery of international relations and foreign policy towards more of the, the rather the center um, through a, variety, uh, a variety of developments within the country and then we'll also discuss the role China plays within the world's um, institutional order um, on an example of the World Trade Organization. Um, to, to start this off with, um, Professor Saik, I would ask you um, a quick question about um, China and how it has moved its position in the world in, in the past, in the past um, decades. Um, would you say that um, we should understand the rise of China in, in any terms um, rather as something or regional or global? So what kind of um, relations of China should we look at in this regard? It's an interesting question because I think um, even though the region around China has probably been its most focal point for interests, it very rarely thought in regional terms at all until really over the last decade. Um, and there its policy really has been one of what I would call carrots and sticks. The carrots are the obvious factors uh, such as the um, uh, Belt and Road, the trade, the investment and so forth. And the sticks of course have been its uh, fierce uh, defense of its uh, territorial claims. Um, and that really has brought it much more closely into that regional orbit uh, where for most countries there, it is the most important, most significant uh, trading partner, investment partner, and so forth. And it's putting pressure on those regional countries, most of which do not want to be forced to be in a position to choose between the United States or China. So very heavily uh, involved in the region, but increasingly a global player, as we see continually in the news. Just to give one metric on that, I was reading some analysis by someone, Andrew Batson, who talked about the state-owned enterprise um, role in global GDP, which over 20 years since it joined uh, WTO has gone from 1% of global GDP to 4.5%. So that really shows that China is becoming a significant player globally. Uh, as we know for America, for many European countries, it is a increasingly important part of their uh, global supply and production chains. It's a uh, part of strategic investments, which is of course now becoming a point of focal criticism, certainly uh, in the United States uh, of America. And it is asserting an increasingly uh, strong view in its global institutions. So yes, regional important, but increasingly important global, globally. Professor Brown, do you have anything to add to that? or to, to perhaps um, to challenge him? Oh, I wouldn't ever uh, challenge Tony. I, I, I am uh, sort of um, uh, really just a sort of supplement. I mean, I, I guess the concept of global China is, is quite a sort of uh, a new one. I, I mean, um, I guess 20 years ago, there were the ideas of sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, China potentially being a global actor when it entered the World Trade Organization. I think it was a bit abstract and now I mean we see it in reality we see China as an actor in the Arctic I think it's an observer on the Arctic Council we see China as an actor in the Antarctica I mean you know when Xi Jinping visited Australia in 2000 I think in 2014 I mean he went to Tasmania and looked across and made some comment about you know we're here too I think there's a three four Chinese research stations in the Antarctica so I mean you couldn't get more sort of extensive than that 
Uh, you've got China, obviously, in Africa as an actor and in Latin America and deep in our supply chains, as Tony just said. I guess the interesting thing is, you know, what is globalization with Chinese characteristics? I mean, how do you indigenize globalization? And um, I think this is kind of where it gets interesting because China is almost an accidental globalist because it, it sort of the size of its economy means that it um, figures just because of the size of the economy. I mean, it, it, you can't be a big player like China and not have an impact. And I think some of that is obviously what China uses uh, to get influence in its region and then more widely. And some of it is just because it's the size it is and it can't do anything to hide that. Um, and so there's a sort of collateral coming from this, which is a bit accidental. The kind of external perceptions of China as a global actor are very contentious though. And really, there's no consensus on what it means to say that China is a global actor, whether that's good or bad. Yeah, I think on the point that Kerry was making that um, in some ways, China's not very sophisticated as a global actor. Um, you know, it's come late to the game. The rules have already been established and there's certain areas where, of course, it can push. But um, it doesn't really have the depth of institutions and knowledge that uh, say, for example, exist in the UK or in Europe or in the United States of America, where you know, we engage at a government level, we engage at a media level, we engage at a diplomatic level, but also through civic uh, society and associations. And China really lacks that. And sometimes that lack of sophistication, I think leads it into problems uh, that it didn't really realize were coming. And he's got caught up in you know, elections in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and I think sometimes it's somewhat bewildered uh, by the situation it finds itself in. Then I thank you very much for your answers to this rather introductory question. And then moving on to the next one, being a bit more specific, what does this actually mean for the relation China engages in with other nations? Um, and also with the rise of China, what kind of changes in the dependency between China and other nations are we going to see? Um, Professor Brown, I would direct this to you first. I suppose so, I mean, it's a huge question. The easiest way to engage with that is to think about the Belt and Road. I mean, because that's China's articulation of its global vision. And it's been so heavily associated with Xi Jinping. It's obviously this is the framework, right? I mean, it's the answer to this, this very big question of what China wants. And I, I mean, the interesting thing about the Belt and Road is that it's so variable, the impact that China's having. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, obviously with the um, controversy over the port, that I think it invested in, Chinese investors invested in, and then, you know, kind of had to basically take the port back from Sri Lankan partners because it was, it was tanking. Um, you had, uh, you know, the influence of, uh, the Belt and Road in Pakistan, where there is no end to Pakistan enthusiasm for the Belt and Road, which I don't think is, I mean, not entirely a kind of, um, uh, you know, a kind of easy thing for, 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 for China. Uh, you've got China in Central Asia, you know, the Belt and Road in Central Asia, the Belt and Road even in Eastern Europe, even in Britain. Um, the one thing which I'd be really interested to hear Tony's views on is there's no Belt and Road in America, obviously. I mean, this is there is definitely a war. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, whether what that means, does that mean that China is actually infiltrating a bit, you know, America's alliances with this new concept? Or is it that sort of in, a, in the end, there will be Belt and Road in America, whether it likes it or not? I mean, is this a bit of a battlefront? Because it's so obvious that this concept is a world without the United States uh, and and you know this is China's sort of dream to have kind of you know that sort of freedom that strategy open to it. Yeah I mean I, I would add a couple of things to what Kerry was just saying is that um, the first is that China's response uh, to vulnerabilities globally has been what it put forward as dual circulation that is more reliance on upgrading its domestic capabilities and less reliance globally. And its fear of things uh, related to problems with access to semiconductors, for example, is not gonna happen uh, purely. I mean, it's gonna be modified in many ways, you know, China, but it really is China trying to set out terms for its global engagement that really reflect its own priorities and its own benefits. In terms of the question that Kerry directed to me 
directly. Yes, it's true. There isn't a Belt and Road, but there are. And I think you see there the difference between, I would say, European and American investments into China and Chinese investments into the United States. And that is distinct from, say, Chinese investments into Europe. You know, for global companies, uh, China is a key part of their strategy and their global production chains. It's well thought out, it's integrated. That is just not true to date with Chinese investments into America. They've been often trophy projects, they've been very ad hoc. And I think in some ways, Washington has woken up to concerns about strategic Chinese investments before they've happened. I don't think that's the case, for example, in Italy, Spain, Greece, for example, and maybe other parts of Europe, but Kerry would know that better than I. Um, but what is being set up, I think, is an interesting potential bifurcation between Washington, uh, its local governments, and its business sector. Um, US companies made $250 billion selling goods in China in 2019. Um, Wall Street is salivating at the possibilities of getting to financial markets in China. Uh, local states, going back to would there be a Belt and Road, would really like Chinese investment in a lot of their infrastructure. And I think China is pushing that. I think they see that as a way to pull the business community away from Washington. Washington's a done deal. I mean, across the board, uh, the negativity, the hostility towards China is pretty much baked in now. Um, then my next question also concerning the, the more general relations China has with other countries is that, um, before China rose um, to be a global economic power, um, it was mostly closely associated with other developing countries. Now, I think it is um, debatable whether China is still fully developing or not developing or um, how to best characterize the economic system there. But um, how would you say half uh, in general the relationships between China and um, its former um, allies um, in need um, develop now that China has, has gained this economic power, um, Professor Syke? It doesn't really have many allies in the sense that we think about it, say, from the United States of America or uh, from Europe. It has uh, uh, countries such as Laos and Kampuchea, where it really just dominates the economies entirely. Um, and I think it goes back to a point I made earlier that many of those countries that have substantial Chinese engagement and investment, many of them are ambivalent. Um, you know, they, they don't want to be forced to choose between, uh, say, a notion of the West and China. They would like to benefit from the trade and the investment, but the politics and the structures that go along with that is different. Having said that, it is also true that China does use uh, where it can its investments to push its own ideas and its own policies. It's done that, uh, again, as Kerry would know better than I would, within the European Union where it's tried because of its investments in some of the Southern uh, nations within the Union uh, to resist the European Union adopting much more critical statements around its human rights policies, for example. But I think what we've seen uh, from a number of surveys after the last year or so, uh, increased negative views of China, um, not just in America, where as I said, it's already baked in, but a number of European countries and also a number of other countries in Southeast Asia. And I saw one survey, I'm afraid I don't remember the details of it now, but when ASEAN countries were posed the question of, do you choose America or do you choose China? Uh, a majority of them uh, came out in choice uh, of the US. So the relationship is evolving, um, comes back. Do they have a soft power that really makes them more attractive? We can be cynical about American uh, soft power, but people kind of grasp onto things it means. And beyond panda bears, I'm not quite sure what that is for China. Professor Brown? And just to say not so much about developing countries, because I think Tony's answered that uh, very clearly, but I mean, certainly on the point about Europe, which I can say a bit about, um, you know, it is very varied. Greece with its investments, I think by Costco, the ocean shipping uh, uh, corporation, state-owned conglomerate uh, into the Piraeus, Piraeus port in Greece. I mean, so that's been a successful investment, job-creating investment. 
uh, but it has come with a political price. I mean, Greece um, has been, well, let's put it in inverted commas, but soft towards China uh, at the European Union level when it's criticized, for instance, issues on Xinjiang and uh, you know, Hong Kong. Um, whereas you get the Czech Republic, which has been very hard. Uh, and you know, I think there's a twinning now between Prague and uh, Taipei. Um, I think the Pirate Party, uh, that, that's the sort of party of the mayor of Prague has been very insistent that it, this, is, this is a sort of a country to country kind of relationship, but there's a recognition that Taipei is a capital city. Um, and so this uh, raises all sorts of interesting diplomatic issues. Uh, ironically, though, um, the Czech Republic, as, I, as far as I know, is also uh, taking the Chinese um, you know, vaccine uh, for, for COVID-19. So it is pretty complicated. On the UK, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying the UK, heaven forbid, is a developing country. Um, that's of course <laughs> not, not the case. On the UK, though, um, there's a survey. I mean, the UK is famously uninterested in its own opinions about other countries, apart from the European Union, which is obsessive about. But there was actually a really interesting survey for the, by the Foreign Policy Centre about um, a couple of months ago on British views towards China and other Asian countries. And um, it, it, not surprisingly, these have been very dim lately. I mean, very, very critical. But there is a quite significant divide. Uh, over 55s, um, who are, um, you know, kind of, say, sort of probably Brexit voters because it's the way that they kind of categorize the socioeconomic grouping for the, these surveys. Um, they're very critical of China, actually want nothing to do with it, do not, you know, have any space in the well for it. Um, but those who are younger have more positive views uh, or more neutral views. I mean, the issues that arise in that, there's just two issues. One is that demographic over 55 are the ones that really, um, you know, voted for Boris Johnson in last, you know, December, 18 months ago. Um, they're the key group that really brought him to power in the kind of, you know, the Northern sort of red, red line constituencies. So, I mean, they will have a significant voice in policy towards China because they're the ones that are really crucial to vote. Um, and the second is, is really this sort of uh, anachronism or, you know, uh, this, this um, quandary that, you know, global Britain having left the shackles of the European Union, you know, and all the rest of it obviously needs to have a kind of partnership with a fifth of the world's GDP, which is China. So it seems strange that one kind of leaves this, uh, you know, kind of body, uh, the European Union, uh, which had a lot of the tough dialogue with China on human rights, because there was a bit of coverage, you know, a bit of sort of protection. Now the UK is very critical on Hong Kong, um, very critical on rights issues, um, and yet also looking to do big business with China. This is a real paradox and quite an interesting case study to work out how this will go forward. Uh, but we do have a prime minister, of course, who said, you know, he likes to have his cake and eat it. I think you'll find Chinese cake is not easy to preserve after you've eaten it. <laughs> Kerry, if I could ask you, because I, I was looking at something um, that China's uh, response towards the UK has, because of the issues you mentioned, I guess, has been quite uh, tough. And it looks as though there might not be much cake there for, for the UK to be able to eat. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Caroline Wilson, who's the current British ambassador to uh, Beijing, was summoned to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs yesterday because she had, I think, put up a Chinese um, kind of WeChat uh, I think kind of thing about, you know, the treatment of the BBC. And she made some comment about how, you know, the former British, uh, the former Chinese ambassador in Britain, uh, Liu Xiaomin, had published something like 170 articles in the Daily Telegraph during these um, several decades here. Sorry, no, one decade here. Um, and she had published one article and it had been censored in, I think, you know, in Chinese. Um, and this has been a huge kind of escalating controversy. And I mean, I think it's indicative of this big deterioration. Um, but I, I think, Tony, the fascinating thing is that the business constituencies in Britain, HSBC, Standard uh, Chartered, um, Jardines, um, although they're not domiciled here, you know, it's a big kind of market for them, Hong Kong. And, and I, I don't quite know how we kind of square this one. We want all this big new business. But I, I mean, China can definitely say no now. You know, the UK is not as significant as it was, you know, even a couple of years ago to China. Interesting. 
Thank you. Then I would perhaps move on to the next question covering a different area of the world, which we haven't looked on too much so far, um, which uh, some of our viewers have been interested in, um, which is the Middle East. And um, I mean, perhaps it's losing significance for the United States. It's definitely not losing significance for China. And um, what would you identify perhaps as the main potential problems here, especially in connection to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is to some extent quite heavily dependent on the region, um, Professor Syke? Yeah, I must admit, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about China and the Middle East, to be quite honest. Um, what we do know, though, is it is still the major supplier of oil for China. Um, it hasn't risen dramatically. It's about half of uh, China's uh, needs that come from the region. So clearly, strategically, in that sense, it's become increasingly important. Um, what it has been very careful at, and I think reasonably successful in, is not getting sucked into and embroiled too heavily in the politics there. Where it has done, it depends on your definition of the Middle East. If you take a broader definition, of course, anything that can poke the Americans in the eye, it will, uh, will do by you know, expressing support for, for different regimes and so forth. Um, but it does not seem as of now, you know, beyond more protection for shipping and so forth, um, it doesn't seem to be interested in uh, stationing troops. It doesn't seem to be interested in getting embroiled in any kind of physical aspect uh, of the politics there. Um, and, you know, like some other areas of the world, um, in Africa, for example, it is still sort of trading off its support for emerging regimes. Um, and one sees that in Africa, for example, with the um, support you know, previously for liberation movements, their anti-colonial movements, which I think gives it a residual sympathy. And so I think it's longer term support for some of the regimes in the Middle East uh, also has helped it in that way. But I really am not a specialist on this area at all, I'm afraid. That is very fair. Professor Brown, do you have anything else to add to that? I mean, my one visit to Saudi Arabia obviously makes me a world expert on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I, I mean, the only thing I would say from that visit, uh, which was a couple of years ago and was very interesting, was um, this is really weird that there's obviously a huge appetite to do business with China. And yet, uh, I think people are very aware that uh, China has been um, implementing policies that it seems to me are fairly anti-Islam. <laughs> um, you know, you've got uh, the, the issue in Xinjiang, obviously, I mean, that's a very specific issue, but a huge issue. But you do have, uh, you know, kind of a lot of restrictions on, uh, you know, kind of Chinese Islamic believers um, and a kind of quite strong uh, uh, kind of, not attack, well, yeah, and actually attack on Wahhabi, you know, the sort of Wahhabi kind of uh, 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 ideology, um, which which I know Saudi Arabian, you know, kind of um, analysts are really aware of. Um, and I, I kind of don't know how long you can maintain this tension between pretty kind of big differences. Um, for sure, China does, as, as Tony said, China does have uh, specific things it wants in the Middle East. And for sure, Middle Eastern governments pro predominantly, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular, are very happy to, at the moment, have friendly relations with China. But this, this is a very kind of big issue, and it's getting bigger about the Chinese treatment, particularly of uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but I, I mean also other Muslim groups, um, as much the Hui, but, you know, certainly kind of significant groups. And I, I just wonder whether Chinese assets abroad will start to figure more in the calculations of, of, you know, kind of groups that are seeking to do something about this, as they have often targeted America and others. I don't see how China keeps out of that calculus. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, certainly governments have been surprisingly quiet to date, but it may well be that um, splinter groups within the different countries may decide that uh, taking direct action, and it has occurred in uh, one or two places where, you know, Chinese investments have come under attack. Often that's been where 
their separatist movements against the national state uh, where the investments are taking place. And it, I think it goes back to the point I made earlier that um, for certain parts of the world, they don't have a very sophisticated apparatus for understanding the local politics. They seem to think, you know, if we're talking at president to president level, we're okay. Thank you very much. Then perhaps taking a different approach now, going back from just looking at regions and looking more at institutions. Um, what would you say is, is the main role international organizations, um, like for example, the WTO, play in shaping China's approach to the world as they existed before China really entered the world stage? And do you think China might have a way of utilizing them to, to achieve their goals? Um, Professor Brown? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the WTA, China's entry to the WTO 20 years ago uh, was, um, yeah, I mean, a big success. It's been a big success. Uh, I mean, unexpectedly, I was a diplomat in Beijing at the time. I think it was November 21, um, you know, 2001, when finally, you know, kind of China did the agreements with all of the various, I think it was 165, 66 different par partners. The EU, of course, was all taken as one. And I, I think the analysis then was this was going to be a big challenge for China. And I mean, we could not have been more wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, it sort of certainly won that that round and, and has won most rounds since. Um, I, I guess um, the, the problem is that, uh, and again, America is key here, um, it's sort of withdrawal from multilateralism during the Trump presidency obviously has been an issue. The Biden presidency is committed to multilateralism again, but I think it's going to leave a residue of suspicion and distrust that, you know, America could go, go, go disappear again. And I think that's a, that is an opportunity for China because it can kind of promote its multilateralism, which is different and is definitely not, you know, kind of promoting the same kind of values as, as America or its allies um, as, as a sort of at least a pragmatic alternative. I think China's got space there. I mean, it's obviously been very active in getting leadership of UN bodies. And this has been something that I think America has been particularly concerned about. And I think uh, the WTO is obviously in a very um, kind of weak state at the moment. It's got new leadership, which might give it a bit more vigor, but you know, it's really sort of had a bashing in the last four years. Finally, I mean, the World Health Organization obviously has really, um, so the claim is that it's almost been annexed by China. I mean, I think that's a bit strong, but you know, the withdrawal by the Trump presidency during a pandemic was a really sort of kind of weird thing to do because it did give China a lot more agency. Um, and the only kind of fly in China's ointment is the fact that West, you know, the place in the world that has done the best dealing with the pandemic is Taiwan. So, you know, this is, this is, there's always a punchline, isn't there? And this is obviously the one that wipes the smile off the Chinese face. But I think, you know, it's, it's, the rest has been fine for China. It's, it's multilateralism has worked. Professor Sai? Yeah, I think I, I don't think anyone can doubt that uh, China has been a major beneficiary of the existing world order and institutions. Um, whether that uh, you know relates to the economic development uh, or other aspects, it's uh, you know that uh, has been tremendously successful. And, and as Kerry said, you know I don't think in two thousand people really thought uh, that the progress could be as strong as it is. And in part, that's created the problems currently because I think when you know, China entered, it was a baby in the global economy. And so people were willing to let things ride. And now it's the proverbial 1,500 pound gorilla, whatever you want to call it. And those things are allowed you know, to be fudged or not to be precise, now become major issues uh, in terms of global trade. I think the there's two things happening. I mean, I think China, I agree with Kerry completely. Yes, they are becoming concerned about, you know, getting the headship of more agencies. I do think on the whole, uh, China does try and abide by its international agreements. But of course, what it would like to do moving forward is shape those international agreements more to its own liking. You see that, for example, with the human rights uh, organizations, I think is a classic example. Um, and I think uh, 
moving forward, I think where China sees the space is in those areas where the global institutions are not already set and embedded heavily in a Western perception of the world. And I think they view that as also contributing to their own domestic development and the upgrading of their own internal capacities uh, by having the dominant voice in uh, some of the uh, new kinds of organizations or develop as we deal with, with global challenges. I think just one word on, on WTO, it is fascinating. There was a PhD student of ours, Yeling Tan, wrote a fascinating PhD thesis on how WTO was absorbed into China. And what she shows is if you look at the Ministry of Commerce, which did a lot of the negotiations, I mean, Kerry would know this well, it uses WTO conforming language. If you look at the National Development Reform Commission, it uses a different language, which is much more oversight developmental state. When you get down to the provincial level and the sub-provincial level, it becomes a much more protectionist language. So, you know, WTO was uh, fought at all kinds of different levels within China, which has sometimes produced outcomes that we get very critical of, uh, but was not necessarily the intention of the central government when they went into those agreements. And quickly following up on this and asking a bit about um, the American position towards the WTO, do you think now that the, that the Biden administration um, might use the leverage, um, well, leverage uh, in quotation marks provided by the, by the Trump administration in, by, as, they, as they barred all appointments of new judges? Do you think that might now be a possible vehicle um, for the Americans to change it? Or will it rather just um, continue to, to be one of their main um, battlefields with China? Um, I think it does relate to a thing that Kerry raised. You don't immediately get credibility again. Um, you know, having opted out, do you just jump full back in and everybody goes along with you? So I think the US has to be careful. It can't be seen to be suddenly reappearing on that global horizon and bullying and being brutal in terms of pushing through what it wants. Um, and I think by and large, the Biden administration has uh, accepted and inherited a Trump approach uh, to China. I don't think we're gonna see a lot of change in that sense. Uh, it may be more predictable, if you like, it might be less sort of uh, subject to whim and fancy over time, but um, that uh, caution is so heavily embedded now, I think, in the in the Washington politics um, that we're not going to see a substantial shifts. Um, I think it's uh, you know it will come up around uh, WTO. I think it's going to come up. Will America, for example, be interested in going back to TPP? It's a tough one. I mean, remember Hillary Clinton ran against TPP as well. Now, perhaps if labor rights were put in, environmental rights were put in, kind of restructured framework, it might go in because people certainly do see that as a bulwark against uh, China's influence. Uh, if you could persuade a number of other groups to come in, you would have far more of the global GDP in that trading organization than you would have outside of it. And that might be an alternative that perhaps could move more swiftly uh, than trying to maneuver and work your way through the WTO. But I, it, it's an open question and there would be a lot of opposition in the US to, to going back uh, to TPP. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Brown, if you don't have anything to add to that, I would quickly move on to another question um, concerning what the changes in China's economic development, which is currently um, slowing down. I mean, the new five-year plan has sometimes, I mean, this is foreign policy, but it has been described by, as a disappointment. Um, do you think that will force China to perhaps be more cooperative with other countries, or will it rather um, just um, be lead to more protectionist policies? Um, Professor Brown? Well, so, I mean, the whole kind of context is, is pan pandemic and post-pandemic kind of recovery. And I mean, who, who knows what Europe or America or anywhere, I mean, how we're going to kind of be able to face this. I mean, I think the expectation is yes. I mean, there'll, 
big growth compared to what's just happened last year with all the economies closing. But that's just because of the impact, uh, very negative impact of you know, COVID. Um, but, but, you know, there will be a recession. I, I mean, I don't think anyone doubts that. And uh, so China, uh, it's whatever, 6% growth, 8% growth, because it's probably going to overachieve this target. Um, looking, you know, you know, looking at itself, yeah, maybe it's a bit disappointing, but looking in comparison, I mean, it's going to be, I'm sure, able to perform well. Um, the issue really is, and I don't know what, what what's going to happen, obviously, but, but um, if the recession is very profound in Europe and America, you know, then suddenly all of this kind of shrill political uh, antagonism towards China is going to look kind of different. I mean, um, you know, if, if we look at the worst case scenario, which I really hope doesn't happen, but if there is a depression and there is mass unemployment and heaven forbid there isn't in Europe and America, and then suddenly, you know, you've got a China which is doing well or doing okay and is able to kind of invest and create jobs, I mean, how does that sort of, you know, balance, you know, you're going to have to stand as a politician and say, no, we're not going to take these opportunities because, you know, our principles are the things that matter most. Um, or you're going to have to basically swallow some of the very hostile and difficult language that's been used in the last year. Um, I, if I was a politician now, for sure, you have to be kind of, you know, sort of aware of what public opinion is. But I would hedge, and I think that's in a weird way, you know, because... Uh, as you know, in Britain, we have um, a world leadership in hypocrisy. So, you know, we have a leader uh, at the moment who really can, you know, say two totally opposing things and believe them. And I think Johnson um, has been able to deploy this language of being a sinophile, while obviously parts of his own party have been extremely hostile, you know, kind of critical of China. And I think um, that will be the holding pattern. But at some point, even he is going to have to commit one side or the other. And that will be dependent on the economics, that the economics leads to geopolitics here. Uh, and I think at the moment, it looks like China is in, in a stronger position. Professor Sai? Yeah, ditto. Um, I think what is interesting is that the um, talk in uh, the US about decoupling has now balanced out. Um, you know, the, the Trump administration was talking about um, selective decoupling. The Biden administration, some of the officials have been talking about managed decoupling. So I think it goes to, to Kerry's point that you can't ignore China. It's real, it's there. And you've got to think about how do you in, engage? And it's going to be different depending on different uh, areas. I mean, trade, yes, that's going to decline, but it was declining anyway. But I think the one area where uh, the US and global finance groups have some sway is on China's uh, global financial engagement. I mean, the US-China financial arrangement is something like 5 trillion US dollars. And China desperately needs access to global financial markets. Um, it ran you know, a year or so ago for the first time uh, a deficit on the current account. And most people are now saying that's going to be structural. Uh, one of the investment groups, I forget which one, started talking about a very significant shortfall, maybe had $250 billion or so. And that means that, you know, it's not only the West, but China also cannot afford to disengage uh, too strongly. And that may be one area where the West has some leverage uh, to push in other, uh, other areas. Uh, and regions. Um, but then there's other areas where China is making the waves, digital currency, for example, so far ahead of the West. I think it's realized that it can't beat back the dollar in the real trading world. And yes, there's renminbi swaps, settlement and trade, so on and so forth. Um, so it's pushing on the digital currency where it thinks it really can get an edge. And I think uh, Washington also is just waking up uh, to that reality. So it, it's going to be a complex picture. I mean, it's real, it's big, it's there. I mean, you, you can't ignore it. 
<laughs> that is that is very fair. And my next answer, my next sorry, my next question um, concerns um, a bit of. Um, I mean, you said that um, Professor Brown, you said that China's um, foreign policy approach is shaped by economics. Um, but as China is being criticised, I mean, more and more so recently, not for its uh, economic policies, but rather for for other things which um, relate more to a criticism on fundamental principles. Do you think it will be possible for China to remain um, ideologically neutral when it comes to um, to um, foreign politics, or will China be forced to engage more um, as the United States does, for example? When you say ideologically neutral, I mean, what, what, what do you mean by that? You mean it keeps out of domestic politics in countries and just sort of tries to be transactional? Exactly, it focuses more on economic policy and it doesn't try to um, have its own set of values and rights, which it um, looks at when it trades with other countries, like the United Kingdom is planning to do yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I'd be interested in Tony's views on this because, I, I mean, the weird thing is that China has this uniform foreign policy that then just gets kind of put wherever it gets, you know, I mean, like here, here's China in Africa, here's China in Latin America and China in Europe, you know, the five principles of peaceful coexistence and all this sort of core, core you know, core principles and um, core interests. And um, it's sort of a little bit strange because I guess for a small country, it's sort of quite, you know, um, uh, sort of flattering to have this big player come along and, you know, use this amazing sort of grand language about, you know, kind of we're going to win win outcome, you know, we're big, you're small, but who cares? Um, as long as you agree with us, it's going to be fine. Um, and I, I sort of think uh, the, the problem with, um, you, you know, this foreign policy approach when China is obviously becoming more and more economically significant, and maybe the world's biggest economy someday, quite soon, is uh, its great vulnerability is it really gets done over by small countries. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, they kind of get it into their domestic politics. I mean, Sri Lanka is a good example. I think even Sri Lankan politicians will admit that their kind of very um, contrary views on China has sucked China into an issue that I think it probably wanted to keep out of. Um, and it's not so much the perception in Sri Lanka, because to be honest, Beijing probably doesn't care. But of course, this particular issue, you know, debt trap diplomacy, and all the rest is then used to beat it up, you know, in more significant stages like America and Europe. Um, you know, and I think people always sort of say, you know, they must ask, you know, you this all the time, um, Toad, you know, what. What is the China policy that works? Well, I reckon it's a combination of North Korea, Japan, and, and you know, Taiwan. You know, they, they, you take those together, you've got Japan, which sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, does things and says nothing, you know, sort of does and doesn't say, you know, it just keeps quiet. Um, but it's still doing big investments in China and still seems to be, you know, absolutely fine. Um, you've got North Korea that, of course, shamelessly blackmails it, you know, off the face of the planet, you know, and completely, you know, sort of gets what it wants most of the time. And you've got Taiwan that I think just because of this deep cultural knowledge knows how to risk manage this issue because it has to, it's a life or death issue. Uh, so, you know, those are not big countries. Well, Japan's a big country, but, you know, North Korea and ta Taiwan are. I mean, ta I think the, the one thing I say to a country about, you know, how do you deal with China is be small, be small. You're <laughs> definitely going to have advantages. Uh, love it. Um... I would just add two quick things. I mean, one is even if China does not intend to interfere in the affairs of other countries, it does just because of its sheer size, you know, and if you start doing belt and road projects, if you start having other investments, if you start putting up Confucius institutes, that is going to become part of domestic politics. Uh, so that mantra is long gone. And the sooner it realizes that probably the better. Second thing, um, I don't disagree with Kerry on this kind of economic pragmatism. I do still believe that Xi Jinping somewhere deep in his soul believes in Marxism. And he does think that the West is in decline and China is on the rise. And he has talked about the continued relevance of historical materialism and that ultimately socialism will triumph over capitalism. Now that might just be kind of rallying the faithful type talk, but I do think it sort of informs their worldview and their thinking 
that there is an inexorable process to history. And of course, under the great leadership of Xi, Xi Jinping, they have actually caught that wave and that they're riding it. And I think it's a severe miscalculation uh, that uh, the idea, yes, in the West, we're obviously beset by huge problems. Our economies might not recover as quickly as China's. But the idea that there is just an unfailing process of decline, I think, is dangerous. Great. Then I would move on quickly to something you, or um, bounce off quickly, something you mentioned earlier, which is, um, to some extent, anti-China sentiment in Asia. I mean, this has become quite prominent in Myanmar as well, with, with, the, with the recent coup and, and the protests which have followed. Um, my question is here, um, with China's um, growing dominance in Asia, um, what kind of response do you think um, might we expect from them? Not necessarily just in the case of Myanmar, but when it comes to turmoil in neighboring countries um, in general? Professor Sai. Well, I think the best strategy for them at the moment is to keep quiet and just uh, concentrate on what the, their neighboring countries appreciate, for the most part, not entirely, which has been the investment, which has been the trade, and not pushing those countries to start making choices, because the choices they might make uh, might not be those, the ones that uh, Beijing wants. And if you think about, you know, it, it's, um, and Evan Fagenbaum wrote this quite some time ago, about the danger of an economic Asia increasingly dominated by China, but a security Asia, which is still dominated by the United States, leaving aside you know, the years of the Trump administration. You know, the US has alliances and strength in the region in a way that China does not. And I think China still needs to be uh, mindful of that as it pushes more aggressively in the South China Sea, as it threatens more with Taiwan, that I think there is still that residual um, fear of China, which might uh, result in pushing those countries back closer to the United States or closer than they may have wished uh, to have done. Um, and, um, you know, one of the criticisms um, we have heard coming back from Myanmar was that the Aung San Suu Kyi regime was getting too close to China. And that was not something the generals wanted. Now, that might just be, well, that might be a way of pacifying American criticism of us, but uh, who knows? So, you know, wherever you go in Southeast Asia, you know, the question of what do we do about China is the question. And most of those countries do not want to be forced to choose. But in certain areas, they'll have to. If you think about AI and internets, you can't really run or GPS, you can't really run a Western system and a Chinese system at the same time. So, you know, choices may be forced on those nations. Professor Brown. Yeah, I remember 12, 13 years ago, a conference, I think in Changsha, uh, and when Chinese, a Chinese academic made this point about, you know, well, we can't be a great power because no one likes us. <laughs> and, you know, we all kind of gave consoling noises, but, but I think it's, it is a really strange thing that, you know, the, the China narrative is very uneven and um, there are still true believers. I mean, Pakistan obviously is a deep and faithful ally, uh, but, you know, you look at two examples, India and Australia in, in the region, India and Australia. I mean, India and China's relations are not kind of uh, relaxing at all, uh, not just because of the border dispute they've still got, but I think they're both nations that have a strong sense of national identity and pride and you know they're both kind of trying to operate culturally in the same space they're competing yeah india is much smaller as an economy at the moment but it's certainly got space to grow it may never be as big as the indian economy but i think their aspirations are massive and um i mean it's extraordinary how much china has invested in not wanting to know about india you know, I mean, they kind of, I think they have 150 Australia study centres in China. I think about three India you know, study centres. So um, with Australia, I, I mean, just, I was obviously based, uh, I was based there, um, you know, from 2012 to 2015. and knew it was a difficult relationship. You know, Australia having suddenly its biggest trading partner, you know, was China, not Europe or America. 
um, was a big kind of identity issue. You know, I think Australia thinks of itself as a European place in, you know, uh, in Asia. Uh, but the relationship from what I've seen from afar um, recently has really deteriorated. And I don't think that's, you know, people say Australia should be a model for, you know, like uh, Britain or America. No, I, I think it shouldn't. I mean, I think it's become really nasty, really choppy. Um, yeah, there's obviously many, many issues about the way China operates in America, uh, Australia. I'm not denying that. Um, but, you know, Australia has got big benefits from China in terms of, you know, enormous amounts of economic benefit. It didn't have 2008, really, you know, no recession then because of what it was doing with China. And, you know, uh, Chinese uh, students at university in Australia have been a huge source of funds across the board. So I think this sort of antagonism, uh, Australia is a good case to watch because, uh, you know, I don't see how China can lose this, really. I mean, it, it probably won't get a huge amount from not having a good relationship with Australia, but it has other options. I think for Australia, I don't know. I mean, you know, having such a big fight with your biggest economic partner is going to have real costs. And I think that is something we all have to try and balance and work a political framework to deal with. Um, Professor Syke, if you don't have anything to add to that, I would perhaps go to, to the, the last nation in on the, on the Asian continent we haven't talked about, namely Russia. And um, in this case, I mean, Russia um, seems to be focused on European politics. Russia seems to have, to some extent, given up on Siberia. What kind of developments do you think we can expect there? Is it just going to not change over time? Or do you think um, China will, will try to expand into that region soon? Well, they've just announced their joint space uh, project. Um, I've always felt, you know, since since the split and everything that's happened, that their relationship between Moscow and Beijing has always been secondary to Moscow to Washington, Beijing to Washington. So I, my general view of that is it, it's, it's largely dictated uh, by the temperature between the other capitals. And you know, they cozy up uh, when they again want to sort of push the European Union or when they want to push perhaps Washington. Uh, but I think the bottom line is for both of those countries, the relationship to the United States is more important than the relationship is between the two of them. Now, of course, they have to manage their relationship together. They have fought a border war. Um, there are tensions. Um, but I think at the moment, uh, you know, Xi is fairly comfortable with Putin. I mean, I think he sees that as a, a model which is in the acceptable realm as far as uh, he is concerned. Um, trade, as far as I'm aware, seems to be quite healthy. Uh, Siberia has a lot of land, uh, which, uh, you know, Chinese farmers, I think, have often been uh, putting envious glances on that they might like to turn and use more productive. Um, you know, I remember many years ago being on the Trans-Siberian Express, and the one thing that really struck me was when I looked out the window on the Russian side of the border, huge amounts of land just not being used. As soon as you crossed into the Chinese side of the border, the land use came right up to the train rails. I don't really know what that says, but it was always something that left a deep lasting impression on me. So I don't see friction in that relationship. I see it as a proverbial marriage of convenience, if you like, but I don't think for either of the countries, it is the crucial uh, relationship. And if I was Russia, um, you know, we talked, uh, Kerry's talked about Belt and Road. I mean, I would be worried about China meddling in what I historically have seen as my backyard as China sort of goes across the stands and making its way into Europe. Uh, I think if I was Russia, I would be watching that very carefully and quite closely in terms of does China have other objectives and other motives in mind with those investments? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, Russia is 8%, I think, isn't it, of the Chinese economy size? Crazy, I mean, this yeah. is not a balanced relationship. And it always <laughs> really amuses me. You know, obviously in Europe, particularly in Britain, you know, Russia and Putin, it's the prince of darkness. You know, I mean, he kind of comes and, you know, sort of gobbles babies up in the middle of the night and does terrible things. I mean, they, they do sometimes do some 
pretty confronting things. Um, I'm not denying that. But in China, I've always been very amused. Putin is like, you know, sort of like a B-list movie star getting invited <laughs> to anything and just turns up. I mean, you know, the Belt and Road annual event, he always turns up at this. Um, and, and it's sort of a very different perception. I mean, when you obviously talk to Chinese, um, you know, kind of colleagues, uh, they don't really get this sort of, you know, they, they understand that Russia is, as, as Tony sort of said, you know, it's, it's strategically, it is a big issue, you know, huge border, nuclear power. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think they can, but they don't think they kind of buy into this sort of existential, you know, evil um, that, that we kind of get from Russia, um, uh, the view of Russia and Putin. Um, I suppose the final thing is that uh, it's always intriguing, you know, Nixon and Kissinger, obviously they, use China as a counterbalance against Russia. And I think one of the things is, is if we do have such a huge issue with Russia, I mean, you know, in Europe, we, we do. I mean, we, we kind of think it's a huge, huge problem. I just get close to the Chinese, you know? <laughs> I mean, I remember being on a train in, uh, you know, China in 2000, no, I mean, it was early in that, 1995. And uh, a kind of American friend said, you know, at that time, it's unusual to see so many foreigners around, you know, and so, you got asked by a lot of people and once they learned you know that you could speak a bit of Chinese they were wanting to ask you a million and one things I got a bit weary and an American friend said to me oh there's a very easy way of dealing with that I said what and he said say you're Russian and then people <laughs> just get kind of get away from you you know I, I mean geopolitics I think it's the same thing just get friendly with Russia right <laughs> uh, get friendly with China and you'll deal with Russia <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Professor Brown. Then I have quite a, a, another quick question, um, being wary of the time, um, which is quickly concerning the relationship between um, Italy and China. Because Italy was quite heavily involved in the Burton Road Initiative as one of the major European countries. But now that COVID has struck Italy particularly hard, especially as, as it was the first country in Europe to to um, be, be caught up by the first wave. What do you think um, will, the relationships between, will the relationship between the two countries look like in the aftermath of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean I've got someone who's working on this as a, a sort of PhD project, so I accidentally kind of know a bit about it. I mean, the, the structural issue doesn't go away though. I mean, Italy is gonna have a very torrid time now. Uh, I mean, it was having a torrid time uh, but uh, it's going to obviously have issues with its economy because of COVID. It's going to have issues with employment and it's got deep structural problems, which is why they've got this new prime minister who's obviously a you know, crisis manager. And China will factor in that, I mean, as a potential source of partnership and growth. I mean, you know, so, yes, there are uh, very kind of critical voices in Italy about, you know, the relationship with China. But uh, at the moment, the fact is that the world's second biggest economy and potentially the biggest economy quite soon is a really small player in Italy as it is in Europe. It should be much bigger. And if you've got a tanking economy with lots and lots of problems, are you gonna just sort of walk away from that uh, because you've got you know, particular, particular political problems? I think that's very, very difficult to do. You can do it, but there's huge costs. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, then being away of the time and knowing that we only have one minute left, I would rather use this time to say thank you to um, both um, you, Professor Brown, and you, Professor Syke. It was lovely having you here as our guests today. And I really enjoyed hearing all your various insights on China and other countries and also the relationship between them. And thank you also very much for everyone who has um, had, uh, had a look at this event and asked questions. It was a pleasure and thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, yes. Kerry.